So good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Contamica. I'm an orthopedic surgeon and associate fellowship director at uh, the Spine Institute of Arizona here in lovely Scottsdale. Um, I do have some disclosures. I do consult for the Pew Synthes on ambulatory spine program development. Additionally, the talk um, does have some images and likeness of uh, a few vendors, um, and uh, you know, they, this talk is intended to be agnostic. Um, so I'm neither endorsing it nor is the LSRS. Uh, and I don't want to really misrepresent myself as a, a master of, of endoscopy, uh, but rather I really still consider myself to be uh, a, a still in the swamp and really a, a lifelong pupil of spine surgery. Uh, I'd like to start off by sharing my, my a bit of my endoscopy journey with you. I, I did my spine surgery fellowship at Ortho Carolina, um, and uh, like many of the surgeons who are part of the Lumbar Spine Surgery uh, Research Society, endoscopy was not an uh, integral part, part of my residency training or fellowship. But I, when I was there, I was grateful to be uh, sort of encouraged to embrace uh, techniques as my uh, practice uh, matured and um, always being mindful of uh, not compromising the fundamental tenets of spine surgery. And then as soon as I left fellowship and went off to start my practice, um, I had a, a fortunate experience of having a conversation with Dr. Garfin, who encouraged me to learn more about endoscopy. And really that gave me uh, quite a bit of pause because I sort of viewed him as a, a pillar of uh, conventional uh, uh, spine surgery. And so that was sort of the seminal moment uh, where I began my interest in endoscopic spine surgery. Um, but I really didn't adopt it immediately. And for largely three reasons. The first being really uh, preconceptions. And honestly, those were likely dogmatic and, and quite biased. The second uh, was in my inexperience with endoscopy, which plays into the uh, emotional component of, on, of taking on this uh, technique. And lastly, uh, um, uh, uh, no perceived need for uh, for endoscopy. And that was really because at the onset of my career, I hadn't yet established um, uh, what I could do well and what I needed to learn to do better. Um, but as time went on, there was one type of pathology uh, that I found a sort of beckon the need uh, for change for me. And that was periforaminal pathology. Um, foraminal and extraforaminal discectomy are well approached through MIS open uh, and tubular uh, methods. Um, and I think uh, when we do those procedures, we, we don't realize probably how much of the facet uh, uh, complex uh, we're actually taking to accomplish a, a good decompression. Um, and then when it comes to more foraminal uh, type stenosis or uh, even a, a foraminal or extra foraminal disc herniation at the L5S1 level, um, I, I was finding that um, uh, MIS TLIF uh, or TLIF in general was sort of uh, going from a, a backup plan to sort of the mainstay, at least in my region of practice while I was in Chicago. Um, but that, you know, raised some concern for me in regards to adjacent segment disease, particularly in the younger population where we're seeing some of this pathology. So that begged me to ask the question of, well, can I do this better? And it dawned on me while I was doing a lateral inner body fusion procedure that perhaps I ought to just change my perspective. And it immediately made me think again of that conversation I had with Dr. Garfin just a few years prior. Um, and so like many of you, uh, as I start taking on new techniques, I went to the literature and looked at some meta-analyses as well as some uh, prospective studies. And, and what I largely found the, the, was that there was really uh, no inferiority uh, in regards to efficacy and safety uh, with endoscopy, um, and that outcomes uh, were similar in the immediate and, and long term. Uh, there were some advantages like decreased length of stay, blood loss, um, and satisfaction seemed to favor uh, endoscopy. So I, I grabbed a textbook and I did some uh, reading on the fundamentals. Uh, represented here is a conventional rigid working channel endoscope. Uh, there's an inflow and outflow component. 
component, uh, which allows a localized fluid pressure uh, to uh, take uh, shape at the end of the scope and, and, and create a potential space where you can work. And you know, a delicate balance of those two also allows for uh, excellent visualization and removal of, the, of some of the debris that you create as you, you uh, move throughout your procedure. Additionally, there's a light source with a camera and there's a working channel uh, where most of your instrumentation will pass through and where you take part in your procedure. Um, I soon learned uh, that that wasn't as simple as that. And really there's an alphabet soup uh, in regards to the different various uh, ways of approaching endoscopy and the different techniques. There was a nice article out of the AO which sort of breaks it down into uh, really two categories. The first being full endoscopic decompression and the second being endoscopic assisted surgery. Um, for full endoscopic procedures, the way to think about it is that your instruments are passing through the same device in which you are visualizing your work, your workspace. And in endoscopy assisted procedures, um, you're using instruments in a separate, uh, a separate plane from that of your scope. Uh, for tonight's talk, uh, you know, Osama will be talking about advanced techniques uh, when we approach the thoracic spine and Ankit will additionally discuss um, uh, endoscopic assisted lumbar fusions. But for the majority of my talk, we're just gonna be looking at mostly um, endoscop full endoscopic decompression and endoscopic assisted surgery as it pertains literally to biportal uh, endoscopy. Um, and, and when you're talking about uniportal and biportal endoscopy, um, there sort of is this spectrum of technique and complexity. And you know, uh, Kim et al. described sort of these three generations of endoscopy, the first being uniportal transforaminal discectomy, the second uniportal interlaminar discectomy, um, the third being uh, unilateral, I'm sorry, uniportal and biportal uh, decompression for stenosis, and then ultimately the uh, sort of um, uh, modified generations, including uh, assisted lumbar fusions. Um, and then, you know, back to my journey, you know, during my third year of practice in Chicago, um, I really took the plunge into endoscopy. Uh, and I had the pleasure of doing that with my good friend and, and partner at the time, uh, Dr. Shish Patel. Uh, and together we, you know, we did several cadaver courses together and we did many of our initial cases together as we thought, you know, two heads are better than one. And, and quite frankly, that was probably one of the most enjoyable parts of this whole journey. Um, and now as I continue to move forward in, in, in this journey, I, I am uh, uh, very uh, fortunate to have my partner at the Spine Institute of Arizona, Kevin Burns, uh, sort of join along with that process. So, you know, how can you on-ramp onto endoscopy? I think initially, like in anything we do, you need, you know, you need to read the literature and listen to current adopters uh, and, and formalize truthful uh, buy-in for yourself. Um, there are um, many uh, books available. This is just one of them that I read very early on um, and, and just really gave me a good foundation in, in some of the fundamentals, helped me review the, the tenets of, of endoscopy uh, and understand really the common uh, pearls and pitfalls. And then the next step is, is uh, you know, entertaining a cadaveric experience. Many of those are industry sponsored. Additionally, some of the societies like the AO Spine and North American Spine Society do uh, host um, uh, uh, live uh, uh, cadaveric courses. And I really encourage you while you're doing those cadaveric courses to uh, really change your starting points and trajectories and see how that alters uh, what you see and what you can do. And if you have the opportunity while you're doing that, make an open approach uh, from the dorsum straight down to where you're working and see you know, some of the common obstacles and how your instruments are hindered in ways in which you can change things to sort of overcome that. It's a really great opportunity. Um, and then seeking out you know, observational experience uh, and mentorship, particularly early on, look for a master, visit them and uh, learn how to overcome some of the common problems that people have, uh, especially early on in their endoscopy experience. Um, and then after you do about 10 or 20 cases, you'll find yourself plateauing a little bit. Um, and that's another great opportunity to go back and sort of now that you know what you don't know or know you're, what you're not very good at, learn how to overcome that with, 
somebody who's a little bit more skilled than you. Um, or you can be as bold as, as uh, my co uh, my co uh, presenter Osama and and take a six month sabbatical and do a um, a, a secondary fellowship in endoscopic spine surgery with Dr. Hofstetter at University of Washington. Um, or you can go and take the opportunity to go to South Korea where this is very much adopted um, and have an opportunity to learn from some of our colleagues across the pond there. And, and if you have a partner who's interested, I, I think it's a great, uh, a great way to grow as, a, as partners, but also uh, just a great way to bounce ideas and, and troubles and commiserate, much like we did you know, through residency and fellowship uh, with our co-residents and co-fellows. And then it's time to get your hands dirty. Line up a bunch of cases uh, if you can, and uh, start with low complexity at more favorable levels. And then as time goes on, you become more comfortable uh, you know, approach more difficult uh, pathology and, and harder levels. Some of the obstacles. I think the biggest obstacle really is perception. You're going to ask yourself, is this simply just another widget? Is this a marketing ploy? And if you can't find the logic uh, behind this, and you know, this is probably not for you. Um, you know, the learning curve, um, like anything, there's a learning curve associated with endoscopy. You're going to ask yourself, can I do this as well as I can do my current mini open or, or tubular discectomy or decompression? What are the hardships I'm going to endure early on? Um, you know, what are my early complications going to be? And then, you know, something to consider are the economics. What are the front end capital costs of doing these procedures? Uh, you know, everyone loves to say a micro disc cost suture. Um, but what I'd like to say is a lot of these systems are agnostic to the towers that already exist in many of your surgery centers in hospitals where you're doing surgery currently. And there are certainly opportunities to lease equipment or pursue case-by-case uh, -case, um, uh, use uh, cost uh, with the equipment that you're using. Um, and then staff education. If, again, if they have experience doing arthroscopy, a lot of this is not gonna be very novel to them. Coding and reimbursement is definitely a challenge and, and one of the biggest uh, uh, resistors to uh, adoption for many. Um, and I think this is the opportunity that a lot of our societies have to sort of step up and advocate uh, for the use of endoscopy. And then for me, you know, when I finished up my residency, uh, uh, a sports fellowship, I promised I'd never put on another pair of, 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 of boots in the OR again and wouldn't only do surgery that I could wear Italian loafers to. But, you know, here I am now again wearing my waders and fishing now for discs. So, uh, you know, the learning curve as we go back to that, um, there are lots of papers on the learning curve because this question, um, um, I think, troubles a lot of people. And two good, uh, two good papers that I'd like to highlight here. The first one here is uh, um, uh, a one that looks at unilateral, or I'm sorry, uniportal approach, uh, particularly interlaminar and transferaminal approaches. It's a single ser a surgeon series, 90 patients, prospective cohort, uh, observed operative time, uh, was seen to decrease uh, approximately 50% after about 50 cases. What I found interesting is one of their primary outcomes was, well, what's the reoperation rate on these patients? And how does it change throughout uh, the learning curve? And really what they found is that there was no change in, in, in complication rate as time went on. They had a 7.8% reoperation rate, three for revision discectomy, uh, three requiring uh, 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 transfer, uh, transfer to, uh, I'm sorry, transition to fusion for instability and one uh, blood patch uh, for a durotomy. There's another study by Sue that looked at about the same amount of cases, about 50 cases. They had a slightly higher reoperation rate um, that happened early on as compared to later in, in that surgeon's experience. And so for me, that led me uh, at least initially to um, uh, do the procedures under uh, general anesthesia uh, and, um, uh, and also utilize neural monitoring. And then when you go to the biportal technique, uh, <clears throat> there's a good study by Sue et al, single surgeon again, a retrospective cohort analysis, 197 patients. Um, and they uh, divided the learning experience into three uh, sort of phases. The first was learning, the second was practicing, and the third was the mastery phase. And what they found for unilateral, biportal, endoscopic discectomy, the mastery phase really began around uh, 32 cases. And then for unilateral, biportic, biportal, endoscopic, bilateral decompression, the, the mastery phase really started around 67 cases. 
when they looked at everything overall, uh, they found out that the mastery phase really began around 54 cases. Their observed derotomy rate was 2% 2 for discectomy and about 3.7% uh, for the decompression cases. So you may ask, you know, is endoscopy a hammer for every procedure in my practice? And my answer at this time is hardly no. Uh, the majority of what I do is, is conventional and MIS-based procedure. And honestly, who doesn't enjoy a good old number two curette? But that is today. And I'm open to the evolution and change in my practice. And who knows what it'll look like in the next 10 to 50 year, 15 years. But I'm uh, convinced that endos endoscopy will certainly be part of it. So I, I thank you very much for your time and your attention, and I look very much forward to the talks of my uh, co-presenters. Mike, thank you very much for walking us through your journey with uh, endoscopy. Looking forward to asking you uh, some questions about that at the end when we do the panel discussion. Uh, next up is uh, Osama, and he's going to talk to us about uh, thoracic um, discectomies. Uh, it's been great having Osama around because he's been taking care of all of these patients for us uh, in our practice. So thank you, Osama. It's much appreciated. And uh, thanks for doing this talk. Absolutely. Thanks uh, for the introduction, Rock, And uh, thanks for your friendship and your support uh, for, you know, from the beginning. Um, and then very sad to, to leave, to go to New York, but obviously uh, super excited. So uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Thanks, Mike, for the uh, great uh, introduction. Um, so I was asked to give a, a presentation on uh, the unilateral, unilateral or uniportal uh, approach, uh, and specifically for thoracic discectomy. And honestly, you know, um, thoracic disc herniation treatment is, so for anybody who is not confident that endoscopy is here to stay, I would say this pathology is the biggest reason why I think uh, spine surgeons should learn endoscopy, because uh, it is going to be in my opinion, the gold standard at some point, at least for the initial attempt uh, for all thoracic discs. So um, here are my uh, disclosures. Um, so I, am a, I, I teach for Joymax and I have a teaching agreement with Globus. The one that's relevant for this is, is Joymax. Um, and as you all know, there's many other vendors. So, uh, and I tried to be as agnostic as possible. Um, so just like Mike was talking about, there are multiple types of endoscopy. What I'm gonna be talking about today is the uniportal uh, full endoscopy, uh, and more specifically to treat uh, thoracic discs. Um, so these are the two different approaches, interlaminar and transforaminal. Mike went through those uh, very uh, well. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking about specifically the transforaminal approach. Um, and this is just an example of what it looks like when you're holding the endoscope. So this is just a video of the chief resident doing an interlaminar case. So you see you have your left hand is maneuvering the working channel and the scope, and your right hand is going in and out uh, uh, with whatever you're using. So in this case, it's a drill, and you see there's screens all about around the room. So it's a very ergonomic uh, type procedure once you get comfortable doing it. So I just wanted to kind of show the setup for people that haven't uh, seen this before. Uh, but again, this is the interlaminar, but if not transforaminal, like what we do for a thoracic disc. Um, so, you know, we went over this a little bit in the first talk. So does endoscopy work for me? There's a steep learning curve. We're treating conditions that already have pretty good outcomes. Um, there's a decrease in productivity initially, and there's a cost. Uh, but to, to all those, my answer is definitely it's, it's, it's worth going through all these and pushing through uh, for your patients. And what are specifically, like when I sit down, I'm like, what is, why is endoscopy good? And to me, the number one thing is the thoracic disc. Uh, treatment. It is game-changing. Um, and associated with that is utilization of the transforaminal route. The transforaminal route is, is, a, um, is a, a path to the spine that's very difficult to do without the endoscope because of the size um, of the endoscope being small enough to fit into the foramen and also because of the angled nature of the scope. So you really can't do it with a microscope. You, it's, it's very, very difficult to, to, to do that without some type of endoscope. Um, and then secondary, you know, there's less nerve irritate retraction, especially when you're taking a disc herniation, let's say in the lumbar spine from uh, a transforaminal route, you definitely don't have to retract on dura like you usually do for a typical micro disc. Uh, disc. Um, there's less soft tissue manipulation. There's less bony removal to get to the lesion. It gets really, it's almost the gold, um, the gold standard, any type of surgery that you want. Cause really, if there's a way that we could like radiate the lesion and not make a skin incision at all and not mess with any bone or ligaments or, 
or any type of, um, of, the, of any part of the joint, that is the gold standard. And this is the closest we have to that. The third thing here is, is the irrigation. These are all under, these procedures are done under constant irrigation and the irrigation acts like a humongous retractor for the dura. Um, so, you know, it's much harder, at least in my opinion, to get a durotomy because you have direct visualization because your eyes are at the level of the lesion rather than far away at the endoscope. Um, and you have the irrigation to push the dura away and create um, uh, barriers there between you and uh, the, the dura uh, and inadvertently biting the nerve uh, or nerve sleeve. Um, so, yeah, so irrigation it helps with durotomies. Uh, with patients with large BMI, because you are, your eyes are at the level of the lesion, it doesn't matter if your patient is a BMI of 60 or a BMI of 10. Um, and there's a study recently that was published that showed that the only difference between large BMI patients and uh, low BMI patients in endoscopy is the positioning time. Other than that, it's all exactly the same because it's the exact same surgery. Once you're in there, it's all the same. And the infection risk is zero because of the irrigation. Um, so as you can see here, the number one reason why I think you should learn endoscopy is for thoracic discs, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So this is a patient um, that came uh, to me with symptoms of thoracic myelopathy, so problems with ambulation and balance, um, was seen by neurology, had every other potential lesion or potential um, uh, disease ruled out. So even though this is a smaller disc and maybe not causing the problem, uh, all uh, signs pointed towards this being the offending agent. Um, and this, to me, was one of the first thoracic discs that I took out. Um, so for this patient here, on exam, had myelopathy signs, was uh, hyperreflexic. So I talked to him about traditional approaches versus endoscopic, and, and he decided to proceed with endoscopy. Um, and you know, now, you know, as I've gotten a lot more comfortable, all these patients, I give them a shot with the endoscope. Because worst case scenario, you you know core this thing out, and either it devascularizes and dies over time, or it makes your open approach easier because it gives you the space to mallet uh, your your offending or the the disc into uh, the cavity that you created with the endoscope. So either way, it works best to start with endoscopy in these cases, in my opinion. So this is a, a setup in the room. So the starting point for um, the, the, for the starting these transpyramidal approaches in the thoracic spine is where the rib starts to curve. So I just feel the patient's rib and where it starts to curve, that's immediately medial to that is my starting point. These incisions are tiny, they're six, seven millimeters. Um, and uh, after you do that, you utilize a, a jam sheeting needle to access your foramen. You can use navigation if you'd like, and navigation, to, in my opinion, uh, really makes the learning curve a lot less steep. Uh, because you don't have to, you're not like plunging into many different areas. You're going right at the foramen that you are looking for, but it's not something that you have to have here. We just used a traditional uh, O-arm spin with the perk pin uh, and utilize the Medtronic um, uh, net navigated jam sheety uh, needle. So what are we aiming for when we're getting into uh, the canal? So I always, for these patients, I always mark them with cement before surgery, and then I get an MRI after the cement. It makes it a lot easier to count during the surgery, and it minimizes the chances of getting a wrong level surgery. So this cement here was done uh, before the procedure, and then I got an MRI, and I looked at the MRI and said, okay, the disc is the level below the cement, and that's what we're aiming for here. And this is kind of the final position that you want to be in for your uh, instruments uh, in, the, in this transferaminal approach. Um, so even though it's called transferaminal, it's really more of a trans superior articulating process approach because you're going through the SAP, you're going through that cost of retrieval junction to get to this point. And the final point that you want to get your jam sheety to is the on the AP to the mid pedicle line, as you can see here. So it's a mid pedicle line. And then on the lateral, you want to be just immediately posterior to the PLL. So you want to be immediately posterior to your um, uh, uh, PLL, as you can see here. And that really should get your scope when you come in to be at a, at a perfect position. Um, so you put the jam sheet in, you put a K wire in there, and after you get the K wire in, then you start using your dilators and your different size reamers. So the system that I use, it starts with a smaller reamer, then it gets the middle one, then it gets the big one, and you sequentially go through that. And once you go through with the largest reamer, then you could put your uh, working channel in. So you see the working channel here is exactly where we want it to be. It's a mid pedicle line. Uh, and you're in the foramen. So this is a great place to start uh, doing the procedure. So I have a video here that I'd like to show. 
Um, let's see. It's going to be a, a, a quick video. Uh, and I'm going to kind of scroll through it. So now this is, you know, you've, you put your working channel in and you put your scope in and what do you see? So when you come in, you initially see your, um, and this is a video by John Ugalade at uh, WashU, great video. And he has great videos usually. Um, so this is on the right side here is the pedicle. And then it goes up into the superior articulating process. And the thing is you see the reamed bone there. So the reaming not only helps with expanding your foramen and doing your foraminoplasty, but also helps you when you come in, you're like, oh, that's the reamed bone. I know where I am here. So that's the principal anatomic landmark. You wanna see the SAP uh, pedicle junction. And then you get, this is a bipolar uh, instrument. So you're just kind of coagulating everything in there. Um, and slowly over time, you're gonna see that the fecal sac will come into your field. Uh, you expand the foramen a little bit more. Uh, so it just depends on what your pathology you're looking for. Sometimes just reaming gets you what you need, but sometimes I'd say most of the time you want to drill uh, your uh, further on the SAP and on the pedicle. And then you also want to drill into the vertebral body, especially if the disc is calcified, just like how you do this with the open surgery, you create a little uh, a pocket or a little window underneath the, the disc, and then you flick the disc down into the um, uh, into the cavity that you created. So just kind of fast forwarding here more. So now you start seeing the dura there. You're using this bipolar to, to get a good plane between your dura, which is super flattened here, and the offending agent, which is the disc. Uh, and that's another nice thing about endoscopy. You could use that bipolar coagulation to, to create planes or to find planes in areas that you don't. Um, so you see here, John is drilling into the vertebral body a little bit, again, to create a little pocket to flick the disc into. And I'm just going to kind of go forward here so you could see a later. So this is, he's grabbing the disc uh, uh, and flicking it into the pocket that he created. And as you slowly over time, you'll see that the dura will expand um, and everything uh, will be a lot more free. So um, you could do all this through, again, six, seven millimeter incision, super minimally invasive, especially compared to the typical procedures, which would be either a thoracotomy or some type of transpedicular uh, or, or caught the transversectomy. So you see now you see the dura really well here, um, and he's getting just the last couple pieces of disc uh, before calling it calling it a day. And and you see all these instruments. Some of them are more curved than others. Your endoscope is also uh, has an angle. It's going to be between you know 20 to 35 degrees depending on what scope and what company you're using. So I thought this is just a, a great video uh, to showcase um, you know this this the specifics of this procedure. So now you you kind of debulked it. You could take some x-rays to check that you got what you're looking for. So you could see in this first picture here, this is a drill. We're kind of on the lateral extent there. That's where we're starting to drill our trough into the the um, uh, into the bone uh, to, to create a little opening to flick the disc into. The second picture shows uh, our Hartman or pituitary across midline. And we know this is a midline disc. So once you cross the midline, then you know that you're good. Uh, and then this, the last two pictures, there's a bipolar picture showing um, how far down and how far up you go. So you really could get all the way across to the other side, depending on how much drilling you've done for the in the foramen uh, and how much you've expanded the foramen. And this is a post-op scan that shows how much bone was reamed or drilled. Um, and you see it's right here. Like it's very, very minimal on the sagittal uh, scan. Uh, and then on the AP or on the, um, on the axial, you see that there's a lot more of the joint that was taken off. So through the six millimeter incision, you got this disc out and the patient went home uh, the next day. This is a post-op scan uh, showing that the disc is gone. So it's really a, a really nice result. And after you get used to this and you get comfortable with doing these smaller discs, then you can go for things that are more intense or more, more crazier cases, I guess. And this is an example here. This all here is a humongous disc herniation. That's not cord. At first, I thought it was cord. The cord is actually flattened all the way on the contralateral uh, lamina and facet joint. Um, and this is, again, did the same thing. You, I marked the patient, got an MRI post-marking to make sure I'm doing surgery at the correct level. And then this is a post-op scan showing a, a beautiful decompression of the cord. And you see how smashed the cord was uh, because you see the T2 change uh, in the cord after the decompression. Um, and again, six millimeter incision, went home the next day. Um, and, uh, you know, honestly, after you get used to this, that these patients go home the same day now. I don't keep them overnight. I used to keep them overnight just to get these scans. But now that after, you know, now after I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with uh, what decompression you can get, I've been sending them home the same day. So what are some risks that are inherent to endoscopic spine surgery? 
Uh, these are all types of procedures, not just the thoracic discs, but you can have seizures, uh, headaches because of the increased pressure from the water. You can have neck pain. And the one that you worry about, especially when you're doing thoracic cases or cervical cases, and, and, which, and, and uh, that's the reason why most people say start with lumbar cases until you get super comfortable and then move up to the cervical and thoracic. Uh, but the water pressure is important. So for, um, you know, for thoracic or cervical cases, you always, like for me at least, I lower the water pressure to the least amount of possible. Uh, and, and the way that I gauge that is I want to make sure that when I'm like an arm's length or half arm's length off the patient, that there's nothing dripping out of the endoscope. And then I slowly go up uh, to the limit, which is, uh, you know, the, the diastolic pressure of the patient. But if you start really low and really be meticulous with keeping your pressures low, I haven't had a problem with, uh, you know, with a cord injury from the water pressure. Um, Derotomies are extremely difficult to close primarily or impossible. Sometimes you could put a second port and close them. Uh, but in my opinion, the dead space is so little that if you just do an on layer and an inlay um, and uh, some type of glue, it's way more than good enough. I have not had any problems with uh, derotomies that have come back for need a second procedure. Uh, and I think, again, it's just a small dead space. So um, I have had a lot of derotomies, no question about it, especially when you're in the learning curve, but they never caused a problem post-op uh, yet, thankfully. Um, and then intraoperable bleeding, you know, that's why you go up with the pressure or the water. You start really low and when things get really bloody in there, then, you know, as a last ditch effort, you have to increase your water pressure. There are other things that you could do as in uh, putting TXA or epinephrine in the irrigation, um, having throbbing on the field or having some type of surge flow in the field. But this is one of the challenges of, of inherent uh, endoscopic spine surgery that I think as you get better at and you become more meticulous with what you're doing, um, uh, you decrease the risks of so this is a paper that is in revision. It's from the endoscopic research uh, uh, um, study group, uh, or sorry, endoscopic spine research group. Is, I wrote that wrong there. Um, so uh, it's a group of people around the country that do uh, endoscopic spine surgery. I think Ray Gardaki, I saw him in the participants. So he's one of the prominent members there. Um, so this is a paper that is not published yet. And these are just a couple of things that I wanted to show from thoracic disc. So this is a meta-analysis of all um, of multiple papers in the literature that dealt with thoracic disc through our traditional methods, meaning thoracotomies or posterior uh, fusion procedures um, with costal transversectomies or transpedicular approaches and compared it to a retrospective case series from multiple institutions around uh, the country, including uh, here at uh, U of M. And what you can see, there's 30% of these patients that are not even getting general anesthesia compared to 100% for traditional methods. Uh, times for surgery are about the same, blood loss way less in endoscopic surgery, as you can see, five, you know, comparing it to about half a liter. Complications are half, reoperations are about the same. So this risk profile favors endoscopic so much. Uh, and then you look at this other table here, and again, these numbers might be not the final numbers, we'll see what the publication shows, uh, but, but you know, I think these are gonna be the numbers that come up in the final publication. Uh, but you see that 60 something percent of these patients are done as outpatient, where 100% of traditional are done as inpatient. And then the length of stay is drastically different. And this number is so important because when you're going to your hospital and you're telling them, you know, I need an endosc endoscopic tower, this is data that you could use to, to prove that point. This is better for my patients based on the first table. Uh, and then it helps the hospital out because you have a decreased length of stay. So why should you take this on? It completes you as a spine surgeon. It allows for the least invasive option for your patients. You always want to do what's best for your patients. Um, and this is clearly better for your patients that have thoracic discs. Um, it opens up opportunities for young surgeons beyond their years of experience. So it makes you prominent in your community or in your hospital because you have a skill that not, not, uh, it's not as widespread yet. Maybe one day it will be about widespread and I think it will. But for now, it definitely opens up opportunities for young surgeons that are beyond their years. And it allows you to enter this international community of, of phenomenal people and endoscopic spine surgeons uh, that we you know, all are, are learning from one another to improve this field and make it uh, safer and better for our patients. So how do you start? Mike went over this. I'm not really gonna, uh, gonna, gonna harp on this, but you know, explore your different vendors, go to courses or do a fellowship. I was fortunate enough to do uh, my fellowship at, at, at Washington and it was a phenomenal time, but not everybody has the luxury uh, to, to take time off and do that. Start with straightforward cases, give yourself lots of time, get connected to other surgeons at different stages of the learning curve and honestly get ready for an, an exhilarating ride. It's been a phenomenal process and, and I recommend it to, to anybody for sure. So thank you all. Uh, for listening to me and I'll have I'll 
take questions at the end after uh, the last talk. Osama, thank you uh, very much for taking the time to do that. And uh, thanks a lot for doing all these endoscopic cases over the last few years. It's been really fun watching you uh, develop as a endoscopic surgeon. Uh, it's been awesome. So uh, thank you very much. Our uh, next and last speaker is going to be uh, uh, Ankit Mehta. Ankit's going to talk about um, uh, dual portal uh, endoscopic approach. Um, so Ankit, thank you very much for taking the time to give this talk. Sincerely appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Rock, for uh, setting this up. And um, thank you, Mike and Osama, for uh, some phenomenal talks uh, regarding uh, uniportal approach uh, for endoscopic spine and how to get uh, get going on this. I think it's uh, extremely important um, to discuss our journeys and um, um, you know become familiar with um, you know how how you know all of you as attendees could uh, you know advance your endoscopic skills. Um, but that being said, I, I see that there are a lot of uh, endoscopic surgeons already on this um, webinar, which which is great. And I'm, it, I'm looking forward to actually hearing a lot of your comments. Okay, so these are my disclosures. Um, I consult uh, for Amplify, uh, and that's the dual portal approach. I would say that's the most relevant um, associate with this talk. Um, so we discussed the uniportal, but dual portal, um, unilateral dual portal um, basically involves two portals of entry, one for your endoscope and one uh, as a working portal. Um, therefore, I, therefore, I would say uh, it's, this is a little bit more um, intuitive, especially for all of us that do open procedures. And um, I would say that the learning curve actually is a little bit easier, um, at least for me. Um, it decouples the endoscope from the surgical instruments, therefore it provides a little bit more flexibility as, as well as visualization of the anatomy. Uh, typically, you initially create a pocket of fluid um, and you can see your relevant anatomy, such as like the lamina or the facet joint. And after that, uh, you, you basically place your endoscope in that pocket and you, with the working portal, you're able to do many of your um, aspects of your procedure. So therefore it's relatively intuitive. Um, I, I feel um, I'm kind of harping on what Mike and Osama have discussed. Um, ultimately, this is, I, I feel is the ultimate minimally invasive approach. Uh, the patients seem like they have less post-operative pain, better visualization, infection rate is virtually zero. Um, there, there is a possibility of also uh, a better fusion rate, especially right through the disk space, because you are able to visualize into the disk space and make sure that you do a complete uh, discectomy, especially when you're doing endoscopic T-lifts. Um, how it's basically decoupling the camera and the working portal, so you're able to uh, visualize the disk space quite, be uh, quite better, uh, quicker learning curve, since you're using the same instruments as well as techniques. So I started um, about one and a half years ago. I'm about nine years in my practice currently. Um, I started actually um, in October. Um, I observed Don Park at UCLA. So again, um, I've always heard about endoscopic spine and um, I found a mentor um, in Don and he invited me over there. So I was able to observe him um, doing a few cases, uh, seeing kind of how he approached it. Um, I, I kind of took notes in terms of what he was doing and I basically practiced on a cadaver. Um, and, you know, I would say that my first, uh, I took the first leap in terms of doing my first endoscopic case with a uh, L4, L5 right-sided uh, foramen on me. I would recommend actually, if you're going to do this dual portal approach that you start off on the left side uh, because this first case took me quite a bit of time um, just because, uh, just because it was going on the contralateral side. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of that, I did uh, about four cases of decompressions before I started doing a T-lift. Um, and then April 2023, I did my first T-lift. I did approximately about 30, uh, 30 more T-lifts as well as decompressions. And then, you know, yesterday, actually, I did a thoracic uh, tuber resection uh, utilizing this approach. So it's been actually a quite quick ramp up phase for me. Um, relatively quick uh, learning curve. So initially, my first case uh, uh, took about six hours, um, which is a significantly long amount of time for doing 
uh, a relatively simple procedure that I would say 95% of nurse or surgeons could do within an hour. Um, and I've gotten it down to, um, so close to one and a half, two hours now. Um, patients are happy. Um, they're thankful for a minimally invasive approach, no infections or revisions, decent pain scores postoperatively. Um, and I, I think it's a powerful technique, uh, like Osama was discussing for uh, thoracic discs, uh, but also thoracic decompressions. Um, and then I've done endoscopic cervical foraminotomies as well. Um, I think it's a very powerful technique uh, for, for that approach. Um, so I wanted to kind of go through uh, a dual portal TLIF and discuss a little bit about the workflow, um, what's involved with it, and kind of how to uh, plan out the case. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, we, we set up, uh, this is a good, actually a good representation. You have your, your the first thing, the, the position is your head is up. You're, you're looking at a screen, um, you know, you don't really have those neck issues that we always worry about uh, as we're as we're doing these cases. Um, your right hand basically has your working portal. Um, your left hand has your endoscope. Um, initially, um, in this case, uh, we were doing a a T lift approach, and you can see that um, your endoscope is in one hand, your working portal is in the other. Um, the toughest part I would say with this case is that once you create a pocket is the triangulation. So you have to have some orientation in terms of trying to get, make sure that both of your instrument tips are meeting. Um, this is, uh, there are some tricks to this. Um, I would say that initially a, a lot of it is kind of feeling that lower laminar edge and making sure that your camera is there as well as uh, your initial docking port for the working portal. Um, I use a um, basically an Arthrex burner, um, and that's usually my first instrument because as you go down with your camera, there's going to be some bleeding there. Um, you coagulate and you visualize the lamina. Um, here we're we're going into the disc space and we're we're taking out disc fragments um, through the dual portal approach. Uh, you use your conventional shaver. Um, you you know can, um, as you're doing a regular T lift, and you could visualize um, as your instruments are going in and out, um, and taking out disc fragments. Um, you you size it appropriately, and um, next you place in um, whatever cage uh, you would like to utilize. I use an expandable cage in these situations. You can see your cage going in, you can visualize it on one screen, on x-ray, and then on the other screen, you can see your cage going in, making sure that you aren't affecting any neural elements. Um, you expand out your cage. Um, and you have already done your decompression. And I basically use um, some image guidance for this. I place in my instrumentation, my screws in afterwards. Um, and I, I would say that this workflow um, actually uh, is relatively intuitive. Um, it, it, you know, it uh, it's something that, uh, it, you know, it's just, it, for me, it wasn't necessarily a learning curve um, associated with how to do a TLIF because, um, I, you know, it's kind of doing the same thing I'm doing in an open approach, but just doing it um, through uh, you know, through two portals. So it, it ends up actually being uh, relatively quick and you have the same benefits that um, Osama and Mike were talking about, but you have um, the ability to, uh, you know, utilize the same skills that you use as an open surgeon. So uh, this is that case from yesterday, actually. Uh, so it was a tumor, uh, thoracic tumor. Um, it was at T12 on the left side of the uh, basically left side of the pedicle. It was eating out the left side of the pedicle, causing neural compression. Uh, you could see that bone was basically, uh, this is a 62 year old guy. He has hepatocellular carcinoma, which is a very vascular tumor. Uh, this is my first case doing a tumor um, associated with this. So, um, and also hepatocellular carcinoma is very bloody. So I had uh, definitely some hesitation before I approached this. Uh, Preoperatively, I had uh, my neuroendovascular surgeon, uh, Ali Alaraj, actually embolize this. So he embolized it. Uh, there were two feeders that were going from T11, T12 on the left side. Uh, Ed Ampowitz was going from T10 um, on the left. 
So we knew we were sufficiently away from that. Um, after he embolized it, actually, it worked out very nicely. Um, the, the bleeding was uh, relatively minimal. Um, we used uh, image guidance because, again, this is my, our first case on this. So um, we placed a midline uh, small incision where we put our reference frame. Uh, and we basically, we find the particular line at um, T11, T12. And we basically at T12, um, we created a small incision for the working portal. And then uh, about two centimeters away, we placed in the endoscope. Um, so again, this is the type of visualization you get. Um, I, I found the lamina first. Um, after we found the lamina, we basically drilled away, um, drilled away the lamina. You can see the thoracic spinal cord here. You can see um, tumor that's lateral to it. Um, basically picking away at this tumor, coagulating the tumor, removing the tumor with a pituitary. And also there's continuous irrigation going out of your working portal. So basically the tumor uh, cells are continuously coming out and leaving this area. Uh, this is, um, as you can see, uh, we, we, with the image guidance, which was very nice, we were able to make sure that we uh, were able to take out um, the tumor actually over to um, the vertebral body. We we're able to clear out actually a decent amount of space um, of the tumor away from the uh, spinal cord. And then um, afterwards, we placed in uh, carbon fiber screws for SRS radiation therapy. Um, so this is a good way to do separation surgery and also um, radiate this patient relatively quickly. So um, since we just operated yesterday, we're planning on radiating him hopefully in, in uh, about three to five days after the surgery. So therefore, um, he's able to get radiation uh, quickly for the, for the tumor. He's able to get good separation and his pain is better. And also there's not that significant amount of morbidity associated with this. Um, you know, I, I saw him this morning. He's telling me that his pain is significantly better and his neurological symptoms have resolved. So um, I feel like this is a great approach, especially for uh, spinal oncology. Um, but again, this is my end of one, my first case. So, um, you know, I'm not going to hang my hat on it, um, but I, I think this is kind of the way uh, I would like to approach a lot of the thoracic uh, spinal tumors in the future. Okay. Uh, and this is our x-ray with our carbon fiber screws and rods. In. Okay. My final thoughts. Um, I feel, I feel like it's uh, using dual portal is, is a good working channel for doing um, a lot of the open procedures that we typically do through a minimally invasive fashion. Um, it was a relatively quick learning curve for me. Um, and it was actually transformative for my MIS spine practice. Um, you know, I would say one other caveat to this. Um, initially, I was doing decompressions, discectomies, and um, I moved on to TLIS. After I moved on to TLIS, um, I spent a week in Korea and I saw kind of the masters um, in Korea doing cervical foraminotomies, doing thoracic cases. And I, I, I saw kind of how they would uh, work with, you know, different things like, you know, water pressure, um, coagulation, um, how they would create a good working portal. Um, and I was able to kind of integrate those into, um, into the cases that I'm doing currently. So I think that, you know, I, initially I was kind of teetering along, but I think I ramped up, uh, you know, with, with these techniques uh, particularly after, you know, spending a week in Korea and, and, and seeing kind of uh, what, what, what a lot of the masters are doing. But um, I, I think, um, I think uh, this was, this has kind of been a very transformative uh, process for my MIS bond practice. And, um, you know, th th those are my thoughts on, on this. Um, and I was, I appreciated hearing uh, Osama and Mike's thoughts as well on it. So um, I would like to open up, uh, I guess, to uh to Q and A. Sorry, give me one second. Okay. So uh, Mike and um, Osama, if you both could come on as well, great.
Okay, so let's... Uh... Okay, the first question is basically uh, current endoscopic discectomy code has uh, zero RVUs and laminectomy codes does not uh, mention whether or not endoscopic laminectomy could apply to the three, uh, sorry, 63047 code. How does one code for endoscopic discectomy um, and endoscopic laminectomy? Um, so, um, Osama, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, not for sure. Not so. Thanks. So, great. Great talk. Um, there definitely is bi-portal or dual portal is something that I am looking to to, to looking into to, to see like because I'm sure there's gonna be some combo between the two approaches that it'll be probably like the the sweet spot. Um, but to, to answer this question, it's a great question. So if you use the endoscopy codes, um, most of them don't have an RVU atom. I'm hoping that that'll change with time. Uh, but as of now. Uh, any, you know, at least that's that's what I did. Any interlaminar approach, you just use the like the six three zero three zero in the lumbar spine, so it's the same as the as the MIS discectomy. Or there's or you just, I guess you just use the MIS or the or six three zero four seven, depending on the insurance company. Um, and if you look at six three zero three zero and you read through it, it says endoscopic assisted at the end, so it's not like um, I think it's just it's not wrong. It probably um, is the best that's there. And then for the um, what's it called? And then for the uh, trans foraminal, you just use the transpedicular code, like you're doing a far lateral disc. So that's the ones that I use. I think it's like it's 63056, I think, but it's whichever the, the trans uh, pedicular code for the trans for interlaminar, it's 63030 or 63047, uh, like the, the, the person who asked that question was. Okay. Um... What are the conversion rates to open approach after a minimally invasive approach with either single or dual? Um, Mike? Uh, I think you're on mute. Uh, yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll that, no problem. Um, so, you know, if you look at the literature, the, the, the reporting on that is quite uh, vast. I mean, it goes from single digits to double digits. Um, I personally, I, you know, I, I've only converted one case. I sort of told myself early on that uh, if I felt at all that uh, the quality of decompression was comp uh, compromised, that I would would definitely open. Um, but also, interestingly, particularly with discs too, um, you know, sometimes if you don't get a very satisfactory uh, decompression, I feel like getting in there and stirring up some of the in like inflammation that you cause, even if you remove some of the disc. Uh, causes that patient to have improvement overall because there's, you're sort of almost recreating a little bit of an injury there and sort of bringing some of the cellular uh, mediators that can come help and, and reduce the disc size. So, uh, you know, that that would be my my personal experience. But again, the the, the literature is varying on, on on rates. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I think for, from my standpoint, um, you know, I haven't had to do that yet, thankfully. But again, I also did a fellowship um, and. Uh, you know, when I was with, with my mentor, so Christoph uh, Hofstetter, he did a bunch of cases, obviously, like, I don't know how many, like, probably, like, I'm sure he's over a thousand, but the, uh, he said the only time that he had to convert to open was not because of a incomplete decompression or because of a CSF leak or something like that. It was because of it, like, he couldn't see because of bleeding. Um, and that's, I think, I, I agree with that because the times that I got very close to saying, you know what, I, I can't do this. I can't see it was from bleeding. So I'd say, honestly, the conversion rates are probably super, super low. I know the, the rates are varying in the literature, but they're probably super low, especially if you take on a case that is appropriate to where you are in that learning curve. Yeah, no, I I, I think definitely it, it depends on, um, you know, the case that you are in that learning curve, because, um, you know, uh, again, if you're, if you're taking on some very complex pathology or you run into a significant amount of bleeding, I, I think, you know, at that point you should open, you know, it, it, because it just doesn't make sense necessarily to, uh, you know, of course, after you give TXA and all those other techniques, um, if, if you're in that situation, you should just kind of convert to open. Um, so far, um, you know, I've had to do it once, for um, endoscopic T lift, where I had a durotomy and I, I didn't feel great about the dura closure, so I ended up opening and and closing the dura. So um, you know, it, one one out of the uh, of the cases I've known. Okay, uh, let me see. So thanks for great talks. So for someone coming out of fellowship, uh, do you have any thoughts on when to start incorporating endoscopy into your practice? 
do you think we should get comfortable with standard open tubular surgeries um, and get through the boards, et cetera, prior to starting endoscopy cases? Um, so that, that's that's actually an excellent question because um, you know I think a lot of it is um, how do you how do you you know incorporate endoscopy and how do you learn endoscopy, especially when you're coming out and you're worried about you know your first like 50 or 100 cases when you're um, coming out with the board, so you don't want to necessarily have complications or do something that uh, uh, is not uh, definitely standard. I would say that um, at, at least for me, I feel like if you're if you're familiar with um, doing standard open tubular surgeries, um, I would probably do my first 50 or 100 cases in that manner and not necessarily. Uh, incorporate a technique, especially if you didn't do it during your fellowship. Um, you know, I would not start doing this technique, you know, for your, during board collection time. I think um, later on, um, you know, I would probably go to some courses, talk with other people, see other surgeons do these operations, and then, um, and then potentially practice on cadaver. And then after you've collected for the boards, then, then start going into it. But um, yeah, Mike and Osama. Well, I disagree because Josh is going to come join us and I want him to start doing these cases right away. Okay, okay. Sorry, Rob. <laughs> you got to start with endoscopic stuff. <laughs> okay. okay, go ahead. <laughs> I think I think techniques change, you know, but principles always stay the same. So if you just adhere to the principles and tenets of fundamental spine surgery, uh, you can adapt it as you see fit in your practice. Um, I, I think the one interesting thing uh, that I've learned through endoscopy is you just see everything through a different uh, oculus and much closer. And it's really cool um, what you can actually see during some of these procedures, you know, for, compared to what you traditionally would see. Uh, but, you know, just like in any type of approach to surgery, you just really have to have your beacons and be able to find yourself in the anatomy that you're navigating. Yeah, I agree. I, mean, I think it all depends on the situation, uh, Josh. So I think here, you know, you're going to have, for you, I guess you'll have your man here who is going to be, uh, who has some experience with it too. So I think with you and him, um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, I think it just depends on the situation. If you have a senior partner or someone there that is doing it, then I think you should start right away and just have, just make sure that person supports you. If you did it in fellowship, I think you could start right away. Uh, but if you didn't have that fellowship and you're the only person in the hospital that does it, then I, I agree with what, you know, what both Mike and Ankit said, which, you know, maybe get 50, 100 cases in before you get through the board collection before starting. Okay. Um, this is a question. Uh, since a quarter for such a large implant is necessary to insert the um, the cage and T-lift along with pedicle screws, what is the advantage of um, UBE versus tubular T lift uh, that can be done through an 18 millimeter tube that doesn't require a fluid pocket. Um, I, I think that's definitely a valid argument. Um, I would say that probably uh, the advantage might be there's less there's less um, you know through a fluid pocket. Uh, it's not just the fluid pocket, but also the visualization that you're getting um, because the camera is right there. You're actually able to view into the disk space. You're able to um, have the fluid pressure move the fecal sac slightly medial as well. You're able to um, you're able to get a decent decompression along, um, but that being said, I do also do um, you know I use I utilize you know like the telogen system. I utilize a tubular retractor for um, certain cases as well. So I I do definitely see an advantage of using sometimes uh, tubular case uh, tubular retractors as well as um, doing endoscopic cases. So um, you know I, I would I kind of give it up. Uh, I I also uh, discuss it with the patient in terms of what they would like to do. But I mean it's a valid argument. What, what do you guys think? I haven't done any fusions, but what I would add to that too is the lack of of retractor time. So if you're using like for example a pedicle brace retraction system. You're putting you're putting compression on the on the soft tissues, and likely causing you know some sort of uh, you know injury to the to the muscle. Uh, you know, so I think this uh, 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 mitigates some of that time that you spend doing that. So that may be one of the advantages of doing it endoscopically. Yeah, I, I think I think from from my standpoint, I'm I'm where where the uh, uh, where the 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 question where we're asked that question. I'm on the same side. I've seen I've seen uh, few endoscopic fusions done. Um, I feel, in my opinion, at this level, I'm not sure, at this level of the technology, I'm not sure it's that much better, in my opinion, but the differences and the potential differences, and, and I 
agree with them. I think the infection rate is going to be lower because of the irrigation. And I think um, every time I, I put it into scope in a disk space, after you think you did a good end plate prep, there's always way more cartilage there. So I think that's the two potential benefits. Is it get to clinical benefit? I think that's what you know, people like Anka and people that are doing that now, once they have enough patients and like publish on that, that's the way we'll know. And if the fusion rates are higher, then I think people will, will uh, haters, I guess like me, will switch uh, uh, to doing it with, with the endoscope. Okay, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think we need, definitely need more literature on that too, for sure. Okay, um, what sort of new technology are you hoping to see to make um, endoscopic spine surgery more accessible to surgeons? Um, as you know, especially as we're taking on more MIS surgery as younger surgeons, I think we're getting a lot of exposure to radiation. And certainly when you're doing endoscopic spine surgery, you know, you're, you're going to have some exposure to getting your access. So, you know, in, you know, utilizing, uh, enabling technologies like navigation and things like that in a more, uh, you know, a smooth form way, I think are some of the things that I'm going to start employing in my personal practice. Um, yeah, I, I would say that, uh, you know, kind of what Osama brought up and Mike brought up, you know, if you do have a lot of bleeding in the field, um, you know, that I think is one of the limitations. So if there's a way to potentially visualize that a little bit better, um, perhaps coagulate the field or, um, you know, some sort of AI type technology, I think that would definitely help out, you know, in, in the process. So um, I think that there's definitely different ways to do this, um, even maybe robotic assisted um, endoscopic, um, you know, maybe the robot holds the scope and it's able to triangulate for you as you're, as you're moving your other arm. I think those types of things are the cool new ideas that might come out and make it more accessible. Okay. Uh, for residents choosing fellowships, uh, first fellowship, how important is it to, uh, to have exposure to these techniques early on in training? Rather, do you recommend prioritizing traditional open and more common MIS mini open training early on? Um, so so I, can, I can answer that. So uh, for someone that did both uh, like a regular spine fellowship, um, I did it at Emory a couple of years ago or, or a while back in 2018. And I went into practice for a couple of years and then went back and did that endoscopic fellowship uh, with Hofstetter at UW. I would say if you know that you want to do endoscopy, you should probably look for a fellowship that has someone that does these. It just makes it so much easier. Uh, that's what I would say. But if you're, you know, obviously at the end of the day, it's a match. If you're, if you're going through the ortho match, but, and, and sometimes these endoscopic fellowships get filled, then it's, it's not like you, I mean, I think most people um, that are very prominent have taught themselves this. So it's not something, I think as long as you're meticulous, you're very critical and you're taken on cases with increasing difficulty and starting from more straightforward cases, you'll be fine. But I think if, you know you want to do endoscopy, I would seek out a, a fellowship that has a significant amount of endoscopy there because you'll learn in that fellowship all the other stuff as well. Yeah, I just want to be respectful of everyone's time. So I, I guess we'll do one last question. I guess if you want to answer one more and then we'll wrap up. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, how, how would you present endoscopy to ASCs in relation to approvals? Uh, uh, that's a great question. Uh, so we just started going to an ASC uh, and then, you know, Rock has been a big proponent of getting the endoscope there. Uh, and then Josh is here. We'll be doing those cases there. So I'm not sure what the what the process is, but it's uh, they're interested in it. I mean, I know all the people that are doing endoscopy or not all, but a lot of them do have these ASCs. So it must be profitable because, you know, they're, they're doing them there. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Mike and Osama and, um, you know, for, uh, for, for your talks. And uh, I, I think we had a great discussion and thank you all for your questions as well. Um, just, thank you guys all for presenting. Also, just a quick reminder for anyone who's still in the meeting. Um, if you all can come to the LSRS meeting in Chicago, that'd be great. And we're also going to have a fantastic ICL uh, this year as well. So um, I, I think it was pretty well attended last year and people had a great time. So it's Please join us this year if you can for both the ICL and the meeting. Uh, I thank all three of you for your time tonight. Really uh, appreciate it. And personally, I learned a ton. I don't think I'll be doing an endoscopy anytime soon, but I, <laughs> I think it's really interesting. So thank you all. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Yeah, thanks, guys. Have a good night.